have you guys grab your seats. And we're going to get started in our adult Sunday school class as we continue in our Old Testament survey through the books of the Old Testament. And today we're going to be covering an overview of the book of Daniel. So let's pray together before we dive in. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we have been blessed by you to have your word, your word that tells us who you are, that reveals your power and your glory. So I ask for your help this morning as we look into it, that you would reveal yourself to us so that we might be changed, so that we would be encouraged and strengthened to know and believe and live according to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you open up your Bibles this morning, we're going to be in the book of Daniel. And this book is really one of the shortest major prophetic books in the Old Testament. And it's one that is most popular amongst Christians today. It has these really short and epic, miraculous stories. And it records a specific time period in Israel's history that was really full of excitement and suspense. The visions and prophecies revealed cover a wide scope with many precise details. And these elements have captured the attention of readers throughout all of history, and I believe it was intended to do so. It's meant to cause awe and amazement, but not merely at the powerful kings of the past, and not even just at the courage of Daniel and his companions, but rather at the sovereign God who rules over all. And that really is the main idea, the theme throughout the entire book of Daniel. It's this, that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms and will reign forever. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the Most High God. The God of heaven and of earth. The one who brings judgment on his chosen disobedient people and who preserves them while in exile. The one who raises up marvelous kingdoms and mighty kings and then topples them in a single night. The one who is faithful to his promises and who is fulfilling them throughout every moment of history. Every paragraph of this book is pointing to the most high God who is sovereign over every single thing. And we ought to be amazed at him as well. We ought to always trust in him. And the timing of this message would have made a huge impact on its original audience, which really takes us to the setting, which we find in the opening verses of this book. In chapter 1, there are a lot of details packed into these verses that really set up the epic stories and prophecies and the main theme we see throughout the book. It is here we find the time period and several main characters traced throughout the following chapters. Look with me in Daniel chapter 1 and following. He starts in verse 1 by saying, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand. This chapter continues to say that there were some vessels, some objects, some golden cups that were taken from the temple of God to the king's temple in Babylon. And with it, the king commanded that his chief, Ashpenaz, would gather up with their treasures, their plunder, some of the finest and brightest next generation, the youths without blemish, that were skillful in wisdom and knowledge and understanding and learning, and bring them back to the king's palace. And he would assign them daily portions of food and drink, and amongst these young men were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah from the tribe of Judah. Now this time period that's described here, the third year of King Jehoiakim of Judah, really dates us to 605 BC, which is referred to as the first deportation. We need to remember that God, over a hundred years prior, sent prophets like Micah and Isaiah to warn God's people of coming judgment and calling God's people to repent. And after the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah began spiraling further and further away from God towards pagan idolatry. And God sent more prophets like Jeremiah and Habakkuk and Ezekiel that were overlapping contemporaries with Daniel 
to warn of this coming destruction of Jerusalem and God's temple and even Judah's exile out of the promised land into Babylonian captivity. Judah had rejected God and refused to listen to his prophets. And in 605 BC, their judgment began just as foretold. And the latest timestamp we find in this book of Daniel is in chapter 10, verse 1, which refers to 536 BC, which is referred to as the first return, rather, of God's people out of exile and starting back towards the promised land. Now, this period of the, is referred to as the exile of Judah. And this is the time period I really want us to understand is present in the book of Daniel. Now, he speaks of a lot of things outside and further ahead in this time period, but this is when these events are taking place. And so we need to understand what the original audience would have been experiencing and why this message was important to them moving forward through history. From a human perspective, this defeats and this deportation would have been devastating to the people of God. The plundering of their temple and the deportation of their best and brightest. It would have been easy to believe that God has abandoned us. Or even worse yet, that our God is not strong enough to protect us. It's during this period of Judah's exile that Daniel records the miraculous deeds and decrees of their sovereign God both vindicating his power and confirming his covenant promises to his people. In moments of devastation, we tend to doubt God's power, but it is in those moments of darkness that God delights to display his divine power over all, not just to you and me, but to the entire world. In these verses, we see also in chapter 1, the earthly ruler responsible for Judah's captivity, King Nebuchadnezzar. And we are introduced to some of the young men of nobility from Judah who were taken into Babylon, specifically Daniel and his companions, which we often refer to as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which are their Babylonian names. Daniel and his friends would have been around 14 to 16 years old at 605 BC when they were deported to Babylon. And by the end of the book, they would have been in their mid-80s. At least Daniel is, as we see him surviving to this time period at the end. And through these people, both Daniel and his companions and King Nebuchadnezzar, the Most High God was displaying his sovereign control over the kingdoms of men. He was showing the world his plan to reign on earth forever. Now, to really look at the uh, structure, or you could say the outline of the book, there's kind of a content structure of the book of Daniel. And oftentimes, as you read through it front to back, you'll find uh, this structure of the first six chapters really give us narratives or stories of this exile period. And then in chapter 7, what we see is this transition to Daniel speaking in the first person, really telling of these visions and dreams and revelations that God's giving him to write down for their people. Both through story and prophecy, God was showing his sovereign authority as the Most High God. But this message was not only for God's chosen people. Much of the content of the book was for the whole world at this time. And this is evidenced both in the content of the book as the kings declare these decrees about who God is to the whole world, but also even in the writing and the creation of this book, it's evidenced. And you see this in the language structure of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel was actually written chapter 1 in Hebrew. And in chapter 2, even um, at verse 4, it shows that something was said in Aramaic and it continues in Aramaic all the way through chapter 7. And then the book concludes and bookends with chapter 8 through 12 written again in Hebrew. And I think this really speaks to the fact that God was seeking to have a message for the entire world in chapter 7, um, 2 rather through 7. And then also messages for his people to comfort and encourage them in what was to come in 8 through 12. And today, having looked at chapter 1 and really seeing the setting, and we're familiar with the story of Daniel's diet, which had less to do with um, really trying to have a sales pitch of what would be healthy. Rather, it's more about who we worship and to worship God alone and to honor him. And God blessed that. And God gave Daniel and his friends wisdom and insight and really positioned them in a place to record and see all that God was doing from a king's perspective during this exile period. 
And so what I want to do is really look at chapters 2 through 7 first. In chapters 2 through 7, we see lots of these narratives of what God was doing during this exile period. And what's helpful is to see, not necessarily just reading through, but there's actually this literary device called a chiasm. And it pairs together these chapters in a helpful way that ties together themes. And if you stretch this out, what you see is in chapters 2 and 7, there's actually this theme about God being sovereign over the kingdoms, both past, present, and future. In chapters 3 and 6, we see that God is sovereign over his people in foreign lands and able to rescue them from persecution in chapters 3 and 6. And then in chapters 4 and 5, we see that God is sovereign over powerful kings and able to humble them. Over and over again through these chapters, we see the sovereignty of God. He's sovereign over all of history. He's sovereign over his people at all times, in all places. And he sovereignly humbles the proud kings of world empires. And he does all of this so that the whole world knows that he alone is the most high God. Let's look first at chapters 2 and 7 together to see some of these themes played out side by side. In chapter 2 of Daniel, we see King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And it's a dream of this marvelous statue. A statue made of different types of metals and materials. And he has this dream and he refuses to tell his wise men at the time what it was. And he says, you tell me the dream and then I'll believe that you actually know how to interpret it. And because they're unable, he threatens them to death. And Daniel, as one of these wise men, finds out about this execution going on. And he says, let me pray to God and ask for him to tell me. And Daniel goes to the king and he wants to Um, by God's enablement, tell the actual dream and the interpretation to King Nebuchadnezzar, and God allows him to do that. And in chapter 7, we see also that Daniel has a vision later in his life, and there's these four beasts of a lion with eagle's wings and this sort of bear that's kind of lopsided and has these ribs in his mouth, and we see this uh, leopard with four heads and four wings, and then there's this terrifying beast with iron teeth and numerous horns on its head. And we see these sort of four sections side by side. And really, in each of these visions, there's this parallel revelation of the kingdoms that were to come. That's the interpretation of both of these. And what's helpful is we're not having to make this jump. The book of Daniel actually records the interpretation for us. And we find throughout this book both the names of Babylon, which was the first kingdom, the head of gold and the lion, We also see that Babylon would fall to the following kingdom, and Medo-Persian Empire, this Medo-Persia, would be the following empire to come. And it is the chest and arms of silver, as well as the bear with the ribs and lopsided, to show this is a merged kingdom, but one is more powerful than the other. But after Medo-Persia, God even says in advance that the kingdom would fall and that there's this Greek empire that would come, which would be the third coming empire, which would be the leopard and the bronze, and that following the fall of this empire would be the final empire that would be continuing throughout, which would be the iron and this beast with horns. And if you notice, there's this sort of theme of the glory of these empires decreasing, but the ferociousness, the firmness, the meanness continuing. And we see that the interpretations of these dreams really help us to understand what God was seeking to do because this isn't the entire story. Knowing these kingdoms is only God's power showing sovereignly over them, but how these dreams, these visions end is far more marvelous and glorious than all of it. If you look in Daniel chapter 2, we see the end of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel actually interprets for him in Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 44, the end of this dream, that there would be this rock that would come and destroy this image. Daniel 2, 44, Daniel is speaking and says, And in the days of those kings, speaking of the iron, that the feet are mixed with clay, he says, During those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms that bring them and bring them rather to an end, and it shall stand forever. 
Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it came and broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. What's amazing here is what happens at the end of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream is a stone actually comes on the scene and destroys all of the kingdoms of the past. They're blown away like chaff, he says. And what happens to this uncut stone is it grows into a mountain that fills the entire earth. That's the end of the Daniel 2 dream that King Nebuchadnezzar has. And listen to the response of King Nebuchadnezzar, because this is important. This is the tying theme together. In Daniel 2, verse 47, the king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God, Daniel, is the God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. King Nebuchadnezzar knew by what God had done in this dream and in bringing and placing Daniel to reveal it, that this God that Daniel served was the most high God and sovereign over all kingdoms. And this was the dream that was given, is that God's kingdom will come and it will reign forever over all. Similarly, in Daniel's vision in chapter 7, he saw the demise of this fourth kingdom, this beast of horns. And he was destroyed, it says, by the ancient of days, referring to God himself. And listen in to the description of what was to come in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, he writes, I saw in the night visions... And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, this son of man that comes with the clouds, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. At the end of Daniel's vision, what he sees is that there's a son of man that comes with the clouds. This son of man describes one who has humanity, but with the clouds describes this divinity in his character. This one is Jesus Christ himself. And even in the gospel narratives, when he's being wrongly tried and interrogated by the priests right before his crucifixion, they said, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ? And he goes to this text and he says, one day you will see me, the son of man coming with the clouds. They knew exactly what was being said there, that he was the anointed one, the Messiah, who would bring in this messianic kingdom that would not fail, that would destroy all others, and that would reign with God's people forever. Both of these stories put together have this parallel pattern that's showing over and over again that the Most High God is sovereign, and he's sovereign over every kingdom, past, present, and future, and he will reign forever. And this truth is displayed in God's sovereign revelation to these future kingdoms that he chooses to establish. Let's look now at the next set of chapters in Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. In Daniel 3, we're familiar with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And in Daniel 6, the all-too-familiar story also of Daniel in the lion's den. Here we see God's sovereign power displayed, not just in prophetically calling it what kingdoms will come and fall in his reign forever, but we also see it in the rescue of his faithful people. And this theme is repeated in these two chapters. Let's look at the pattern first. If you look... There's this repeated idea of Daniel or his companions in danger. In Daniel 3, we see that Daniel's companions are actually in danger because they won't worship this golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And he says, if you will not bow down and worship, I will throw you in the fiery furnace. And in Daniel 6, Daniel is in a position where he must obey King Darius's edict of Persia because you can't break the laws. And there were these guys that were jealous. And he says, no, I will pray to the most high God. I will not pray to you. And he has to be thrown then as a punishment into the lion's den. So they're both put in danger because they choose to serve God and not man. And then there's this persecution, right? They're persecuted because they won't worship a false God according to the edict of a king. And then it shows that they're being faithful to God and displayed this faithfulness even unto the point of death. 
Miraculously, though, in each of these stories, God rescues his saints. And miraculously, as a conclusion, you see the kings in both stories declare God's power to save. Listen to these parallel declarations. In chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar saw this um, fourth appearance in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, one that he said was like the son of the gods in the fire. And he calls out to these servants of the Most High God to come out of the fire. And they have zero effect of this fire. Not even a smell is on them. There's no singed hairs. And in Daniel 3, 28, Scripture records, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel to deliver his servants who trusted in him, and set aside the king's commands, and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, and language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. The king of the known world saw the sovereign God at work to rescue his people, and he declared to the nations, this is the one true God who is able to save. Similarly, at the end of chapter 6, King Darius makes this statement in Daniel 6, 25. Scripture records, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. He says, I love this statement because it's the statement of a humbled man. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. He is the one who delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. As we know, Daniel was untouched, and he was brought out of the lion's den, while those who were conspiring against him were condemned to the pit and destroyed. It's amazing that in both of these stories, you see God's sovereign power to rescue his faithful people. He is the Most High God who is sovereign over all kingdoms, and he will reign forever. And when the King of Heaven rescues his people in a foreign land. That truth is both seen and declared by kings of world empires. God shows his sovereign, eternal rule through prophetic dreams and through the preservation of his saints. But we also see in the next set of chapters of Daniel 4 and 5 that he also shows it through his power to humble proud kings. And we see this in chapter 4, where King Nebuchadnezzar is this now coming to the end of his reign, older in his days, and he sees this dream of a tree that is, is brilliant and marvelous and huge, and all the earth is coming to shelter under it. And he doesn't understand that there's an angel that comes and cuts down the tree. And he has Daniel come to interpret for him what happens. And then also in Daniel uh, chapter 5, we see one of his predecessors, referred to as his son, uh, King Belshazzar, that he is having this celebration. And you remember in chapter 1, stories do this, really good stories. They have this like nugget of information in chapter 1 about those treasures that were plundered from Jerusalem. And then they bring it up later. And in chapter 5, you see him bringing those out of the temple of his gods. And they're drinking and celebrating as if to mock the gods that they've defeated. And here we see that he's terrified because there's this hand that shows up writing a message on the wall to him. And in both of these stories, you see there's a king that receives revelation from God, that Daniel is the one who's called to interpret for this king, and that there's bad news revealed about a proud king. King Nebuchadnezzar is standing on his balcony, so to speak, of his kingdom and saying, look at the mighty Babylon I have built, and he is the tree. That's to be cut down if he would not repent, Daniel says. And the bad news revealed to the proud king of Darius in this message of meeny, meeny, tekel, parson that we'll read here in just a second. And then finally, you see that God's word of bad news, so to speak, of condemnation, of humbling judgment to these kings comes precisely to pass just as he says it would. 
And we see two different conclusions in contrast. In Daniel 5, we see that the kingdom is removed and that Babylon falls from King Darius. But we see that the kingdom is actually restored to King Nebuchadnezzar because of his humble turning. First, let's look at the verses in Daniel 5. In Daniel 5, starting in verse 26, Daniel says, This is the interpretation of the man or the message you saw on the wall. Meaning, meaning God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar came or gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple and chains of gold. He was given all these rewards that initially he said, I, I don't even want those. I'm going to tell you the message though. And then it says in Daniel 5.30, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed and the kingdom fell. We see that God was able to humble the proud king who mocked the most high God. But then flip back to chapter 4. And at the end of chapter 4, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar was the tree that was cut down and he actually lost his mind. He became like a wild beast of the field for seven years, it says. And then he promises that God would return him and restore his kingdom because the stump was actually left, it says in the dream. And then look what King Nebuchadnezzar responds, what he says in Daniel 4, verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. The most high God is sovereign over all kings of the earth and he will reign forever. And it's evident in his power to humble even the kings of the known world. These narratives depict powerfully the timeless truth repeated in all of scripture that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Having reviewed chapters two through seven, we move forward now into the second half of the book of Daniel. Daniel transitions back into writing in the Hebrew language here in chapter eight and is writing in the first person according to the revelation of God and shows the latter years of his life, what is in the latter years of his life, rather, what is to come. And along with this focus of the visions, um, he has these sort of details that are meant to encourage and strengthen God's people, Judah. And he's seeking to remind them of this truth, that the sovereign God is bringing about history according to his perfectly decreed plan, and that they can trust in him. In chapter 8, Daniel's vision here is of the ram and the goat, and the ram refers to Medo-Persia, and the goat refers to Greece, these empires that were to come and are mentioned by name. And the king of Greece um, would conquer Medo-Persia, and it is referred to as this great powerful horn that suddenly breaks off. And that historically refers to Alexander the Great, who dies at the young age of 33, but yet in 12 years conquered the known world. And then after this comes a little horn that would persecute the Jews and desecrate their temple. In Daniel 8.25, he records, Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. But listen to the verse ending. And he shall be broken. How? It says, but by no human hand. God is the one who judges the kings that even are to come. And this vision showed God's people the terrible time that would come during the silent period. And was a call for them to endure by trusting in their God who is sovereign over the future kingdoms. Knew exactly what was to come. This is the Most High God who is sovereign over all the kingdoms past, present, and future, and he has them rise and fall according to his will. What I'd like to do is spend some more time in chapter 9. 
In chapter 9, um, we find famously Daniel's prayer. And really the structure and outline of Daniel chapter 9 is his prayer in verses 1 through 19, um, and then God's answer in verses 20 through 27. And here what we see is Daniel is uh, praying to his God for Israel's repentance and restoration to their promised land. And what we find is that God answers his prayer, and God reveals his decree for Israel's repentance and their restoration to their promised land. And there's this theme throughout the book of prayer that is um, powerful, as when we think about what is a right response, and we ought to see that prayer is littered throughout this book, that we ought to pray to the sovereign God. But what I want to do is focus on God's answer here, um, because it's, it's really an important text that highlights God's plans for Israel, and it's referred to as the 70 weeks. And first, we need to understand, um, look here at Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, uh, the purpose, the purpose of his writing. Look at just verse 24. He says, the angel Gabriel is sent and speaks to Daniel and says, 70 weeks, or 70 sevens, are decreed about your people, speaking to Daniel, and your holy city to accomplish six things, he says. Finish the transgression, to put to an end to sin, put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. What we find here is that the purpose of what uh, is being revealed to Daniel is that this is about to unfold God's plan to fulfill his promises to Israel, both physically and spiritually. And for us in this survey of the Old Testament, we need to track that this isn't something that's brand new. Um, there are new details that are going to come in regards to the timeline, but what he's seeking to decree here has to do with covenants that have already been made. As we've seen in Genesis 15, the Abrahamic covenant that God made about the land and the seed that was to come and the blessing for all the earth. And we see in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Davidic covenant that through the line of King David would come an eternal king who would reign eternally in God's place over God's people. And again, in Jeremiah 31, we saw the new covenant that God himself will write his law on their hearts and forgive them so that they will live forever with him. These covenants stack on each other, and here we see that he has a plan to fulfill it all to his people. All those promises will be fulfilled, and now he says, here is how God is going to do it. We see not only the purpose laid out in verse 24, but we also see the schedule. God has a schedule for his redemptive history. And it starts in verse 25. In verse 25, he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It shall be built again with squares and moats, but in a troubled time. So we see here in verse 25, there's this seven-week period and this 62 weeks. And in the context, this word weeks means groups of seven. And, and in the, the writing of Daniel, this is referring to years. He's been thinking about years. He just saw 70 years were decreed for exile in the readings of Jeremiah at the beginning of this chapter. And there's even evidence that later he uses the term weeks and says of days. So in a different chapter. So he's specifying here that he's talking about years. So seven weeks is really 49 years that God's decreed. And 62 weeks is 62 times seven, which is 434 years. And the reason you saw me say there in verse 25, seven weeks and 62, is because I believe it's a more accurate translation based on the text in Hebrew. Not because I know Hebrew, but because I read people who know Hebrew. And um, both the NIV and the NASAB, which are more literal in their translation, translated that way to say seven weeks and 62. So why not just sum these together? If they're, if they're um, conjoined together and that you see this section is supposed to bring about um, the, the restoration of um, Jerusalem and the temple being rebuilt, um, it's because after 49 years it's built, but then we see the description of 62 weeks is that there is this troubled time that happens, it said in verse 25. But that's, if you add them together, that doesn't get us to the full 70. There's this one week that he still continues to write about. So if we add 7, 62, and 1, Daniel's math checks out, right? Um, and actually, it's not even Daniel's. It's God's through Gabriel, right? Um, so 70 weeks is the total. And let's continue reading in verse 96, uh, 9 verse 26, um, what he says. He says, and after the 62 weeks, okay, so we saw 7 and 62. So what comes next? After the 62 weeks... 
The anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war and desolations decreed. So what we find here is actually that there's a section of time that's not necessarily given um, a, a number of weeks. But there's actually an after the 62 weeks period that's often referred to as this gap of verse 26. In verse 26, it says there's certain things that will happen. Specifically, the Messiah, the anointed one, will be cut off after the 62 weeks. That Zion will be destroyed and that wars and desolations will ensue. So there's this description that, the, that Gabriel gives to Daniel saying, after 7 and 62, there's this moment that happens. And when you actually look at the history of what happened, that 49 and 434, you actually track out to Jesus' um, coming on a donkey and re received God's people as the anointed one, the Messiah, the son of the king of David. And they receive him, but right after the 62 weeks, it says he is cut off. He is crucified, and he's rejected by his people. And soon after, we also see the destruction of Jerusalem and the desecration of the temple. And we see that we're in this time period that wasn't given a set number of years, but that is um, described as wars and desolations that were decreed by God. But what we see is the end of these 70 weeks. In the final week, the final seven years is described in Daniel verse 9, verse 27. In chapter 9, verse 27, he says, And he, referring to the previous verse, the prince of the power of the air, this evil prince, this antichrist, shall make a strong covenant with many for, he says, one week, that seven-year period. And for half of the week, three and a half years, shall put to an end, to put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So what's important here is that a lot of this has already transpired as God has said perfectly, which means this final week that is yet to come is going to happen just as God said. And even if there are others who are like-minded, who maybe have a different hermeneutical reading, what you can't miss here is that God has allotted the exact amount of time for his promises to be fulfilled. Therefore, his people should trust in him and endure forever. And the reason is because God is the Most High God. He is sovereign over all kingdoms, and he will reign forever. We're going to briefly summarize the final three chapters in chapter 10, um, 11, and 12. And really, this is a, a section that shows Daniel's vision of both Israel's current place, their future to come, and their final conflicts that will ensue. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel saw a heavenly messenger who spoke of the spiritual warfare that was present during the first return of the Jews to Jerusalem. And this section shows us that the conflict we see on earth is a reflection of the conflict happening in the spiritual realm. A conflict that will continue until God's appointed end where he will triumph and reign eternally. We also see in Daniel chapter 11 that Daniel saw a detailed vision of the future earthly conflicts between nations. It's immensely detailed, so much so that um, uh, people who actually deny the authority of God and ability to see the future actually say, there's no way Daniel actually wrote this in the 6th century BC. It must have been closer to like the 100s BC because he had to just be a historian recording it. But we know that God is sovereign. And in this detailed vision, this passage gives uh, selective details of the overview of historical events that would cover Daniel's time, both in the 6th century BC until the final victory of God over the kingdoms of men. And this section in 11 is so precise and accurate that it's been um, recorded and it's meant to cause God's people to be awestruck by who their God is. That he is the God who is sovereignly bringing about his perfect will. And there's lots of details in here of really during the silent period, what happened between the kings of Greece and how the north king and the south king would fight and battle and move back and forth. And then they would try to have a treaty. And they would. Um, there's um, all these things involved that if you look at history, it's amazing how God unfolded everything just as he said. But we also see in chapters 12, uh, chapter 12, the conclusion of this resurrection hope for God's people and an encouragement to endure. In chapter 12, Daniel saw the times of the end. And the chapter opens with this resurrection hope for those who are faithful 
to the very end. Look at Daniel chapter 12, starting in verse 1. And at that time shall arise Michael, who's the archangel that seems to be specifically over God's chosen people, the Jews, and the nation of Judah. And, and the great prince who, was, who has, rather, charge of your people. And, okay, I'm going to start over because I jumbled through that. I described and then it said the same thing. I'm just going to read it. <laughs> at the same time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt." This book closes with angels even inquiring about the timing of this final and awful persecution, showing that God alone is the sovereign one. Even the angels are doing his will, but they don't know all these details. And they're reassured that God has numbered the days of the last three and a half years of the tribulation of his chosen people. This ending both acknowledges the severity of their suffering while pointing to their most high God who is sovereign even over death. The theme throughout this book of Daniel is clear and evident. The most high God is sovereign. He is most high. He is sovereign over all single kingdoms, every single one. And he alone will reign forever. And if you know this God as your Lord and Savior, if you know Jesus Christ who died and rose again, that he alone can rescue you from sin and bring you into his kingdom forever, you are one who will walk in humility under God's sovereign authority. And you're one who will live faithfully for him, even through trials, knowing that our eternal king, Jesus Christ, will come again. He will defeat all enemies with finality, And he will reign eternally with his redeemed. One of the songs that has um, stuck out to me as I've been studying through this summarizes this well. And it's a song that has um, been an encouragement to me over many years. It's called All Glory Be to Christ. Listen to these lyrics. His will be done. His kingdom come on earth as is above. Who is himself our daily bread. Praise him the Lord of love. Let living water satisfy the thirsty without price. We will take a cup of kindness, yet all glory be to Christ. When on that day the great I am, the faithful and the true, the lamb who was for sinners slain is making all things new. Behold, our God shall live with us and be our steadfast light. And we shall ere his people be, all glory be to Christ. I hope you will come back next week as we continue our study through the survey of the Old Testament that has rich truths that ought to impact and change us for an eternity. Next week, um, we'll be covering an overview of Chronicles, uh, the first and second Chronicles, which historically was, was listed as a single book. And we hope that uh, you will stay with us this morning as we seek to join in praise to our Most High God. You are dismissed.